And so before we I welcome our guest speaker this evening, I would like to invite Peter Blaskos uh, to share with us his words of wisdom. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good evening. Just a thought for today. We look forward to being in our usual place when we can dine together face to face in the Coach and Horses conservatory room instead of operating this thing called Zoom. But tonight, don't let it technology intrude as the Vice Chancellor forecasts the future of food. Thanks very much, Peter. <laughs> Right, you're, you'll be now be muted, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm now, um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Quinta McKellar, Professor Quinta McKellar, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hertfordshire. And the university is an institution that is a major part of the Hertfordshire economy with a reputation that seems to grow every year. Now Quinta took on the position of Vice Chancellor in 2011, having previously been principal of the Royal Vet College. Quinton has a, a tremendous interest in the subject of food, whether it be on four legs or grown in fields. Outside the academic world, one of Quinton's passions is rowing, having rowed for Scotland in the Commonwealth Games in 1986, and now continues in his interest in the sport by qualifying for more senior competition. And Quinton assures me that he still keeps the average age of the crew down. So I'm now handing over to Quinton, the future of food. Quinton. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, I have to tell you that the, the average age of the crews that I row in seems to be increasing uh, 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 at an incredible pace. Um, what I've done, though, I've, I've written a, a short essay um, which takes you forward somewhat and I've got a hero in this particular essay and the hero's name is Gordon Morrison. So let me take you forward <laughs> to May 2050 and introduce you to Gordon who's now 100 and he's in ruddy good health. The problems he experienced when he was 80 resolved when predictive analytics were introduced. Wearable heart and blood pressure monitors on his watch are supplemented by an affordable diagnostic kit, which he uses each week. Blood is collected by a painless microstab system, and the urine sample presents little problem since his bladder functions <laughs> all too quickly. <laughs> the results feed automatically into the analytical app on his phone, which produces a thumbs up emoji, and automatically orders a nutritious meal to suit his physiology and progressing pathology. Dinner will be a pizza. Does he want a particular shape? He vaguely remembers a US president called Trump and asks for one that looks like him. The Central Food Preparatory Unit, which serves North London, receives the digital message from the app, which triggers the 3D food printer to mix the dough, select the tomato sauce, meat substitute, and cheese, pass them into the injectors, which momentarily prepare the pizza with the unmistakable Buffon hairstyle of Donald Trump. As the pizza is whisked away to the drone, which will deliver it to Chalcaldine, it's funny to think that it was once rural, the inventory system in the preparatory unit adds flour, tomatoes, meat substitute, and cheese to the appropriate blockchain ledger. Baking flour is sourced from producers in the vast prairies of Canada, which did well from global warming. Increased rainfall, temperatures and carbon dioxide levels increased the productivity of the gene-edited varieties grown. Sadly, wheat and soya importation from Brazil and the USA has virtually stopped as the Mato Grosso and the Midwest USA, especially Nebraska and Kansas became deserts. Gordon feels a bit guilty that one of the ingredients of his pizza shown on his app with the unmistakable small oil rig marker is harvested using diesel fed harvesters. Nevertheless, full automation substantially overcame the inefficiencies 
associated with human drivers of combines and is pleased at the drone planting whereby the seeds and requisite nutrients are now fired in pods from the air has improved soil quality and enhanced plant growth. Furthermore, the satellite directed drone spraying specific target areas where crop protection chemicals are required and has substantially reduced their use. Indeed, some of the more pest resistant genetically modified varieties require hardly any chemicals at all. The tomatoes are all grown locally in large vertical farms in the Lee Valley. These developed with other vegetable and fruit growers in a halo around London but are now consolidated within the expanding metropolis. It's good to know that there are no pesticides, herbicides or fungicides used in the semi-sterile vertical units. There has been some concern that the scarcity of phosphate fertilizer, the required, might spike the costs since China recently bought most of Morocco. But our relationships with China have warmed since the Hong Kong summer of 2021. Fortunately, the fertilizer uplift has been offset by the new robotic pickers, the capital repayments of which are at last cheaper than the immigrant workers so long loved by British agriculture. Furthermore, the ability to accurately microdose the tomato plants with the exact requisite amount of phosphate has greatly helped reduce requirements. Although the meat substitute could have been replaced by a real cultured meat, now biologically the same and cheaper than meat derived from livestock, Gordon's health check recommended a plant-based substitute. Now that the balance of canola and coconut oil have been optimized, the chickpea-based meat substitute tastes quite good. And although it's a bit heavy in salt, the low cholesterol is ideal for Gordon. The meat substitute really caught on when iron-based heme produced from genetically modified yeast became a ubiquitous ingredient. Heme is part of the oxygen carrying component of red blood cells and give, gives meat its juicy, juicy redness and meaty taste. There is a sadness in some quarters that there are no sheep or cattle south of Liverpool, but most people accept that the consequent reduction in greenhouse gases is a good thing. Some environmental, environmentalists are now advocating badger control since their ex explosive population growth following the removal of cattle has decimated all the ground nesting bird varieties and virtually exterminated hedgehog populations. The provenance of the wheat, tomatoes and chickpeas are all checked on arrival at the food preparatory unit using DNA barcodes, which are essentially incorruptible and of course, as the barcode is inherent to the product, are consumed by the customer. The cheese for the pizza is now made entirely at the food preparatory. Genetically modified yeast produces perfect copies of bovine um, or ovine casein and whey, of course, from genetic lines which historically produced the best cheese. This is now manufactured on an industrial scale together with liquid milk replicate, which after suitable filtration can be sold as GMO free, all the yeast having been extracted. The packaging for transporting the pizza in the drone is biodegradable plastic made from cellulose and lignin derived from grasses and reeds grown in the estuaries of rivers and on unproductive agricultural or recreational land. This innovation has greatly reduced the plastic found in oceans and consumed by aquatic wildlife. Almost all fish consumed by people are now farmed since the feeding of surplus forage fish from sea fishing to farmed fish was banned as fears of a BSE like syndrome in fish being transmitted to man. Sea fishing has become uneconomic. The fatty acids such as omega-3s essential to healthy fish growth are now produced by microalgae, which grow faster and do not require the land use of terrestrial plant alternatives. On arrival at Caldeen, Gordon heats and eats the pizza. He fondly remembers 
before the coronavirus pandemics of the 20s, how he used to buy his own pizza bases, using the fridge to keep tomatoes fresh, and how impressed he was with his first smart fridge, which had an integrated thermometer and inventory system, predicting his requirements and alerting him when bacteria or fungi grew to unacceptable levels on older food. In those days, his fridge was groaning with supplies derived from more than 20 countries. Now it's just got a couple of bottles of beer, which they make from fermented waste foods like perishable bread. He likes to keep them for an emergency, since the drone can take up to half an hour to get to him. Otherwise, he doesn't use the fridge anymore. So this Morrison scenario is not science fiction. Every part of it is now science fact. Some at early prototype stages, such as the DNA barcoding and the algal omega production, but nevertheless, all are real and plausible outcomes. Some such as plant-based meats are now making real market inroads. The veggie sausage roll being credited with increasing the profits at Greggs, uh, the bakers, and a real dip being recorded in British meat consumption. But what does it mean for British farming? Will we really have parts of the UK without domestic livestock? And where they do survive, will it be in parks, their function to support conservation management? Will the production of staples such as corn and wheat become technological rather than agricultural challenges? And will our vegetables and possibly fruit be grown in giant vertical farms, utilizing hydroponics and thus saving water and land? Well, we can predict with confidence that when Gordon is 100, if he makes it, he will be one of 9.7 billion inhabitants on the planet, of which more than 60% will live in cities. This compares with just over 2.5 billion in 1950 when he was born, of whom less than 20% could have been classed as urban city dwellers. We can also predict that by 2050, there may be more than 5 billion middle-class people, many of them in China, and they will have the ec economic wherewithal to choose what kind of food they would like to eat. We've also seen in 2019, a substantive change in the belief in the realities of climate change. And at least in developed economies, a growth in activism, primarily by young people demanding action to reduce greenhouse gas emission. It remains to be seen, of course, whether the striking school children will all now be cycling to school. Nevertheless, the impact of agriculture is already colossal. It comprises about 40% of all land use, consumes 70% of all fresh water and produces 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. It's also been held accused of reducing biodiversity, particularly impacting pollinators, although much of the biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity loss is a consequence of agriculturally associated deforestation. Agriculture is responsible for substantive degradation of at least a quarter of current farmland. As the political economic center of the world moves from the Northwest to the Southeast, the agricultural temperate and subtropical belts will move towards the poles. New trade routes will be established and state driven land acquisitions are likely to increase. The bottom line is that by 2050, we will need to produce 60% more food and on the basis of current utilization, we will use 55% 50 more fresh water and 80% more energy. There are currently 570 million farms in the world, but perhaps surprisingly to those of us living in the West, only 4% of these are in high income countries and almost three quarters of all farms are less than one hectare in size. It's likely that urbanization will continue and that smaller farms in tropical areas will become highly stressed by changes in climate and lack of water. The main food production systems will undoubtedly embrace many of the technologies identified in the production of Gordon's pizzas. On farms, unmanned autonomous vehicles are a certainty. Enhanced genetics, nutrition and health are already with us, but will undoubtedly improve much further. Vertical farming is a reality and robotics continue to advance as vision and picking systems improve. 
In the Netherlands, 22% of all dairies now employ robotic milkers. But whether natural milk will be replaced by synthetic milk remains to be seen. The technology utilizes yeast, genetically engineered to produce the same proteins <clears throat> produced by cows and can, can be made, of course, without lactose, gluten or cholesterol, or indeed the risk of contamination with antibiotics or hormones. The producers of synthetic milk may be encouraged by the growth of milk alternatives based on soy, almond, coconut, rice and oats, which have seen worldwide sales grow by 60% in five years to 21 billion US dollars. Although some jurisdictions don't permit these to be labeled as milk, for example, soy milk, they are often uh, accessed on the same aisle and proximate shelves to natural milk in supermarkets. And this may have contributed to their success. Drone-based systems are likely to be introduced for mapping, analyzing, planting, diagnostics and spraying. Currently, aerial planting and spraying may be more effectively carried out by helicopter or aeroplane, which can carry, our heavy, uh, carry heavier payloads. But as drones develop, they're likely to embrace these tasks too. Drone systems may be supported by satellite imagery, which could be utilized on larger scales and for which algorithms now enhance and augment the intuition and craft of farming. Supply chains and last mile delivery are likely to evolve with blockchain logistics and DNA barcoding, ensuring traceability and provenance of foodstuffs and smart thermometers and inventory sensors supporting cold chain transport and reducing the risk of contamination of, of pathogen growth. The COVID pandemic has undoubtedly accelerated this evolution. It's also likely that drones or at least autonomous Druid technology will support the last mile of delivery. Whether Gordon will be able to throw away his fridge is debatable. The rapid rise in single person households, there are now 80 million single person households in China who are likely to be attracted to on request delivery of single meals does make it a possibility. But the requirement to eat pre-chilled or semi-frozen products like ice cream and the flexibility to, uh, to have to hand beer and wine storage give the fridge a reasonable future. Furthermore, the smart fridge coordinating with the last mile delivery mechanisms make, powerful, make a powerful team combining combination utility and safety. At various levels, personalized medicine and nutrition are likely to grow. The technology is there, but will probably, be, probably require further refinement to create the level of convenience that would encourage widespread uptake. Issues around personal data, anonymity and security apart, big data, artificial intelligence and the predictive analysis will encourage and enhance the personalization of nutrition. But will uh, an NHS under pressure seize on these innovations as an effective means to improve health en masse? Or will personal nutrition become only for the most wealthy and of course the hypochondriacs? There are of course broader social considerations associated with food. The breaking of bread and the communal meal have been part of family and society as far back as we can trace. Now there are more television programs, magazines and books devoted to food and the artist, artistry of its preparation than there have ever been. And reducing food to a, <clears throat> a, clinic, a clinical and physiological necessity does it a great injustice. Let us hope that the technologies and efficiencies essential to feed 10 billion people remain our servants and do not become our masters and that they can support the great comfort and enjoyment that good eating and drinking bring. Thank you very much. Gordon, questions? Thanks, Thanks very much, Quentin. What a fascinating, interesting and relevant talk.